Hello, I'm Brian Scordato, and this is the Idea to Startup podcast brought to you by Tacklebox. Today, we've got an amazing guest, Brian Linton, the founder of United by Blue, stopped by to tell us his story. Brian's got about as unique a background as you can have, and the way he built United by Blue and the startup that preceded it are absolutely crammed with lessons for early stage folks. What I found maybe most interesting about Brian was how he has built a profitable, growing company that is still so focused on a cause. For each product sold, United by Blue removes one pound of trash from an ocean. This type of focus requires enormous trade-offs, and Brian gets deep into how he thinks about and makes those decisions. This is an amazing interview I think you'll get a lot out of. I hope you enjoy, and have a great week. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I think a good place to start is just for anybody who doesn't know, tell us about United by Blue. Tell us about what you do. So United by Blue is a brand of sustainable apparel and accessories with a focus on ocean and waterway conservation. So for every product that we sell, we remove a pound of trash from oceans and waterways through company organized and hosted cleanups, um, which is actually something we've been doing for 10 years now. And removed nearly 2.5 million pounds of trash wow. um, by selling an equivalent amount of products. Incredible. There's a lot that I want to dig in from that, from that little soundbite, um, but we'll get there. So for the podcast, what we generally do is go through like origin story and go through how this, this idea came to be. But I think in your case, I was doing research for the podcast and I noticed you had a really unique and interesting upbringing. And I think kind of grounding people in that might be helpful for your perspective on the rest of the company and how you guys differentiate and all that. So maybe it'd be interesting to first touch on that. For sure. Yeah, I, I grew up, I'm born in the Green Mountains of Vermont, where mm -hmm. my parents were, went to school. And then I, in the, in the 80s, when I was one, we moved to Japan. And then I grew up my entire upbringing was it was in Asia, uh, predominantly after Japan, it was it was Southeast Asia and Singapore. Wow. And, you know, that was a big part of shaping, obviously, who I am as, as, as you know, somebody who's, whose family is all from the States, but growing up overseas really was what created my view of the world and my view of even, even the environment and sustainability, because I had a chance to travel around Southeast Asia a lot growing up going you know, to all the different coastal areas, especially, you know, say Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, wow. uh, Vietnam. And, and so one of, one of the things that I, I really realized early on in my, in my life was just how beautiful the natural world is, mm -hmm. but also how polluted it was even at that time, say in, in the 90s and early 2000s, which is what, at, a t at a time when people weren't really talking about ocean plastic pollution. It was, it existed, but it wasn't, it wasn't the conversation that it is today. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm not the, the quintessential person that started a brand and focused on the ocean because I loved surfing or water sports. I was much more into the aquatic world for the aquatic world in terms of like fish and plants and biology. So back in Singapore, I had 30 fish tanks in my bedroom and wow. I would breed and raise all these different fish. And I had sort of a, a it was a very unprofitable, but business in the sense that I was, I was raising these high value fish that you know, I'd breed and then I would sell back to the pet stores. Um, I sold one fish when I left high school when I was like 18 for a thousand dollars cash. Um, wow. A living fish, that is. <laughs> yeah. So like all of those things, you know, really shaped my beliefs and my view of, of the aquatic world and, and conservation because one thing I knew about fish, these, these incredibly expensive fish that I was raising as a teenager was that if I didn't keep the water clean, if I didn't have good water quality, they would die. And, and it happened to me, you know, I'd have a fish that died and it would, it would rock my world because it was not only a, my, you know, my, my pet, but it was, it was, it was something of great value. And what we're doing to this world now with, with the natural aquatic world is very equivalent to what, you know, would happen on, on a micro scale with, with a fish tank. So when I came to the States and I, I started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life, it, it was evident to me that I wanted to do something that was connected to protecting our natural spaces, in particular, our blue parts of the planet. Hmm. That's fascinating. Um, so were you sort of thinking that you were going to figure out something to act as a vehicle to help clean up the ocean and, and help with that cause? And, and were you sort of like agnostic to what that was, but you wanted to make sure the cause was, was the cause? Yeah. So initially when I came and I went to school, 
I wanted to be a marine biologist or a biology teacher. I was really into, again, the science side of the world and, and, and felt like, you know, I could, I could have a positive impact on the planet either by, by being a marine biologist or by teaching biology to, to people that would, would be able to do something obviously good for the world. It didn't really dawn on me until I started dabbling in uh, business because I've always been in sales, whether or not I was selling those fish or selling yo-yos or different imports that I would bring into Singapore, Beanie Baby Phase, Pokemon mm-hmm. cards, all of those things. And I, I didn't really p- put it together that those two things could coexist mm-hmm. until I started my first brand when I was 19. And from day one of that first brand, I was like, oh, I'm going to start a brand. I'm 19 years old, 2005, 2006. The most logical way to do good with business at that at that time and sort of in my entrepreneurial infancy was to donate money mm. to people to do good for me, right? That's, that's sort of, especially what, 15, 16 years ago now, that was the way to do good. And so I donated 5% of proceeds to ocean conservation. And I did that for several years um, in college, paying for my college, also, you know, learning the chops of, of, of sales and business. But it really became clear to me when I was combining environmentalism with business that there was something much bigger that I could even do with conservation that I wasn't necessarily doing with the financial donation alone. And that's sort of the, the from an environmental standpoint, what led to the the mission of not giving money away, but instead internalizing that and creating a brand around rolling up our sleeves, getting our hands dirty and having a much bigger impact on the planet as a result, because it's entirely integrated into our DNA. It's not just like a like a line a line on my P&L that says I donated X amount of money to somebody. Yeah, and that comes across so strongly. So I've been a fan of the brand for a while. My sister is a crazy outdoors person, and she made me aware of the brand probably, I would say, four years ago, maybe three, four years ago. And it just jumps off. It screams that this is a purpose-driven brand. Like every single ounce of the company is aligned and I thought that was like incredible. I remember that just made such an impact on me. And so like hearing about the origins makes sense that this has been a through line for your career. So um, I actually want to dig in on that early first brand. So can you tell me a little bit about the brand? What was it that you started when you were 19 and, and what did you learn from it? Yeah. So it was a freshman in college and I, I was, I actually landed from Singapore in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I went to the small liberal arts college, hmm. um, crazy really how I ended up there. I, I have no idea actually why I, I, I went there. I only, I only stayed there a year. Um, and, but the, the most beautiful part of being there was that it forced me to explore business in a way that I don't think I would have if I was in an atmosphere that I, I was really engaged in and enjoyed. And I have nothing against mm-hmm. Michigan, but I, you know, I grew up in metropolitan cities and I ended up in this very small city without a car, without a driver's license. Hmm. Um, and I was very isolated. I felt very, very alone and isolated. So I started to read a ton of business books. I, I became somewhat obsessed with sales literature and like, I mean, really stuff that like, you know, it's obscure to think that I was reading like things like the sales Bible or, hmm. you know, strategies on sales or, you know, I mean, even the more fluffy stuff like rich dad, poor dad. Hmm. And I, I just got really into that as a 19 year old or as an 18 year old when I got there. And it led me to believe that I wanted to start a business. And so when I was in my second semester, I started putting together what I wanted to do that summer, which was my grandparents and my extended family is all from uh, Massachusetts specifically, they're, they're, they're Cape Codder. So they're from like the coastal resort areas, but they, you know, they're full-time residents there. Mm. And so I would go there in the summertime because my, my parents at the time still lived in Asia. So I would, I would, I was planning on spending my summer there. And so I, I, I put together a business plan for, uh, importing jewelry from Thailand, which I had some connections in mm. and really just basic mark market arbitrage, where again, as a teenager growing up, I would, I would see all of this, you know, shell, cocoa bead necklace styles that were in the markets of Thailand or Philippines or Indonesia, or, you know, these, these, these more tropical, like Southeast Asian nations where I could buy them for 20 cents, 50 cents. And then I remember always coming to the States and seeing again in say Cape Cod in the stores, these same items selling for five, 10 bucks. So mm-hmm. it didn't take really a rocket science to, <laughs> to, to figure out that I was like, Oh, there's, there's significant margin in this fashion uh, jewelry business. So I, I wanted to, to import, that product as my own brand mm. and sell it to those stores. And, and that's what I did. So I, I started a brand called Sand Shack, which is the predecessor to United by Blue. Um, started that back in 2006 mm. and essentially started to 
import and sell jewelry to the, the, the coastal resort stores in Cape Cod and then, and then expand from there uh, during my college years. Wow. And, and so, so then did you shift and go to college somewhere else after that first year? I did, yeah. I left Calvin College, the, the, the school in Michigan, and I went to Beijing uh, for a year. I went to a program there at a Beijing Institute of Education. It was a Chinese language focused program mm. um, where it was really to get back into, again, sort of being isolated and alone feeling in, in the Midwest. Mm. I wanted to, to get in back into Asia. Beijing was a new, a new place for me, and, and it felt a lot more comfortable. So I, I landed there. Um, I spent a full year, academic year there, and uh, that was also where I started to put together more of a supply chain for the resort merchandise business. So I started making connections with um, with jewelry vendors, which would then become my 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 new set of vendors for the business over the next few years. Hmm. F- for that time in my life, running that business was very seasonal, so it was a very summertime based business because that's when those stores were open. So it, it it worked well for school because I would be in school hmm. and then I would spend you know that two two and a half months um, with my grandparents in Massachusetts and I would run the business essentially then. And then outside of that time would be school and sourcing and figuring out my next step. Incredible. So you were sort of laying the groundwork for understanding supply chain and all the mechanisms of a, of a retailer really, really early on. Yeah. I mean, that's entirely it. I mean, you know, I, I learned first and foremost, the, the basics of branding. Like I wasn't, I, I was always thinking about, okay, this is going to be a brand. I'm going to brand it, design. I did, I mean, everything from scratch as many people do when they're starting, but especially because I was so young and I had no resources. So I, you know, learning Photoshop and Illustrator, creating my first catalog, creating my first website, creating my logo, creating my hang tags, creating, you know, doing my own photography, <laughs> um, every single thing down, down to like the my, most minute detail I had to, I had to do, um, mm. which was, Again, an incredible learning experience. Walking into to, to the first set of, of stores, for instance, and literally as again as, as as a teenager, pitching my merchandise, my brand to to people that I didn't even know what a buyer was. I didn't know how <laughs> stores operated. I was you know whipping out jewelry out of my pockets, and, like, <laughs> and and I remember it was very. I mean, for the first you know at the time, it seemed like a long a long time period of trying before my first sale. But like in reality. It was amazing to experience this. The most amazing feeling that I probably ever had in business was in that first couple of weeks of, mm-hmm. of trying to sell and, and, and finally, you know, selling a display of jewelry to a store called the Boarding House on in Hyannis, Massachusetts. It's probably one of the only accounts I ever remember the actual sale of because it was so, so meaningful. And I got a check on the spot. I got back wow. into my car, my 96 Ford Taurus, which is just <laughs> total piece of junk. And I was, I was like, I was pounding the roof. I was so excited. It was like a $300 sale. But it was the most amazing sale ever because I did it all on my own and I did it through total cold call walk into the store. And that's what I did for years. Wow. Um, I would I would travel around that I started traveling down all the way to like Key West. Um, I would drive that that that, that, that tourist down down to Key West and then I, I worked my way up town by town, basing my decision of where to go next based upon the recommendation of whatever store I just sold to in the previous town. Wow. And I went into hundreds, if not thousands, of of these stores in 2006, seven and eight, nine, and and built the business through wholesale channels, um, selling to people like that. So this wasn't like a rinky dink business. This was a serious operation, uh, basically wholesaling jewelry up and down the coast. That's incredible. It was as it was a it was a rinky dink serious <laughs> operation. I was storing a lot of my inventory in, in my trunk. I would get it. I would get it. You know, sent via FedEx, and then I would. I would label it all, um, either in hotel rooms or if I was back, you know, in my grandparents' garage. I I would I would I would try to do immediate fulfillment. So I would I would have enough inventory and displays, these wire displays, these counter racks, where I would take the order. I'd go out to the car, I'd load it up with jewelry, I'd come back in, put it on the counter, and get a check. You know, I ended up probably getting a hundred or so stores um, on the East Coast wow. that way. Um, so yeah, and, and again, all through cold calls. So if you think about the conversion rate of a store. <laughs> you know, how many stores you're going to land and how many you got to go into. It was, it was quite a learning experience. And I look back and I will never have anything quite as interesting or as, as, as enriching as that ever again. It's, it felt like a slog at the time, but mm-hmm. it was so, it was so fulfilling. It was such an exciting time of my life. It taught me so much. That's so cool. And I think that there's, you know, we work with founders who are often, yeah, have established a career and that sort of thing. And when we're talking about their starting something from scratch, it's not that there's not a willingness to do that kind of 
grunt work or to kind of really get in the weeds. I think it's just this feeling that like, oh, maybe you should be past that. Maybe you should hire someone to handle sourcing or hire someone for sales and marketing or hire someone to design your logo. And I think there is, I'm, I'm sure you, by doing each of those things, you understood the business far better than obviously you would have if you hadn't. And I, I imagine that that's helped with United by Blue. I imagine those understanding what it takes to get a sale and all that has been transferable. It has been. I mean, it, it definitely shaped my entire perspective on on business. And, you know, I think that at the time I didn't, I, I never thought that that brand was something that was just going to be a moment of learning for me, but it was my education. It was, it was more important than college. It was more important than working for another company because it was the most impactful thing I could do at that stage in my life in terms of setting myself up for a career of being in an industry where those lessons, despite it being very different to my day to day now, they, they really shaped everything about how I, I think about sales and branding and relationships because it was the most rudimentary form of all of those. Mm, cool. That's great. And there's like, it's funny when it resonated so much that that feeling of getting that $300. I remember the, a company that I'd started that was a silly mobile dating app back in 2011. I remember the first time I saw someone using it the app in like uh -huh. Starbucks and I like saw them over their shoulder and I literally almost started crying on the spot, but that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was a silly thing. But anyway, um, so I think that that's a really good background. And then, so I'm interested, like, how did you, what were sort of the inflection points or the learnings that made you say, all right, there's, there's a shift here to be made. And I think there's an opportunity for me to build something in the apparel space or in the, the sporting goods or however you wanted to, to label it space. You know, I think that the um, the realization it, there was not there was not this one aha moment. It was more of this 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 realization as we entered the. Um, I graduated from my undergrad in 2008 from actually in Philadelphia. I, I ended up leaving China and then I I came to Philadelphia to go to my my last and final year of college. I did three different hmm. institutions over over three years and and, and finished here in, in, at Temple University in, in Philadelphia. Hmm. Um, I, I landed here because not because I, I didn't even know where Philadelphia was on a map. I could have drawn I could have drawn the entire world map, but I, I, I didn't really know anything about this uh, this city. And I met my now wife, who is also studying in China. So I met her in Beijing, mm. um, and then you know we started dating. And then I was like, okay, you know I'm I'm, I'm a nomadic. I can I can go wherever. So I ended up in Philadelphia, and that's where I've been for the last 12, 13 years. Mm. But anyways, back to sort of at that time, I was I was still doing. The, the previous brand, Sanchak. So I moved here in, to Philadelphia in 2007 and graduated from, from school in 2008. And then, what, September, October 2008, the bottom fell out, world mm. economy collapsed. I didn't really know any different, right? I mean, people that graduated at that time were graduating into the worst economy of the last 100 years. Mm. But, you know, for me, I was always intentional about doing my own business. So when I graduated, I never, it never crossed my mind that I was not going to do that. So the hardships that I faced didn't really, they were really, it was really bad. Like, I mean, all those coastal stores, those hundred stores that I was selling to, I mean, probably half of them disappeared over wow. the next 12 to 18 months. Hmm. Um, many of them not paying me. Luckily that, that on, on demand fulfillment where I was <laughs> putting a display and getting a check at the same time saved me probably, but <laughs> there was definitely some that, you know, I naively extended terms to that was more fundamental in shaping what I wanted to do next because it made me realize the limitations of what I was doing and and the fact that I wasn't really growing a business that was scalable or a brand that had legs it was more of a I was becoming more of a of, a, of like a commodity dealer of, mm. of fashion jewelry mm. and so when I started looking at the landscape again as at that time you know 21 22 started looking at what I knew about the retail world and, and the stores that were the most interesting and the most stable appeared to be the ones that were selling these outdoor brands, which again, I didn't even know what the outdoor industry was. I didn't really know what the difference between the stores were, but you know, when I would go in and I would see these stores and I would see these really well, more well run, they'd been around for you know, 20, 30 years versus like the pop, you know, these resort stores that would you know pop up and go out of business and disappear. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like there was a lot more stability there. And, and they were also selling the brand that really spoke to me, whether or not that was like, you know, a Patagonia or, you know, more conventional stuff, like an, even the like North Face. These, these were brands that spoke to what I loved about the world, which was the outdoors. Mm -hmm. 
again, I didn't know what the outdoor industry was, but I, I said, you know, I want to sell products to these stores. I don't want to sell to these other stores that are selling cheap crap jewelry that I'm a part of, as well as, you know, $5 t-shirts and like, you know, three for $10 tees, mm-hmm. all of that junk that you see when you're, when you're, when you go to the beach. Mm-hmm. So I started shifting my belief or my, my view of, of, of what I wanted to do. And I, it became evident to me that I had to do something new. Mm-hmm. It wasn't going to be selling that same brand to those stores. Um, so I also realized that despite, you know, having a model of donating 5% of proceeds to ocean conservation with the predecessor brand, I wasn't really doing anything impactful or meaningful. And the customer base also wasn't seeing it as anything special. So I wanted to create a brand that was going to have a more concrete, tangible mission and also sell into this industry that I thought was the most exciting and most stable in industry in this very turbulent economical time. So that was what sort of led to the realization that I was going to start a brand new brand. And for a time period, they, they overlapped. I was selling this jewelry line as well as the new t-shirt line, United by Blue. And it took a couple of years of, of, of building United by Blue to realize that that was ultimately the longer term opportunity. And, and that's when I was fully, fully dedicated. So I think you just glossed over something that is like really important. You just said it took a couple of years of this. That's an extraordinary thing to kind of stick with something. So many people try and start something and it turns over in six months or they don't recognize the growth in six months or they aren't able to see something that is potentially lasting or whatever. The feedback loop's too long. So I'm interested in those and a few things actually. First... So Patagonia was a brand, it sounds like that was inspiring or at least something that you thought was um, something like aspirational for you. What other brands were out there, if any, that, that you really looked up to? At that time, you know, there was a, they've changed their name, but they were called at the time Horny Toad. Hmm. Um, they're called Toad, Toad and Co. Now. I, I always thought wherever I was in these, especially outdoor stores, you know, when I was starting out, I saw them and I thought that they were doing really cool stuff or, you know, even like. Prana, which is now owned by Columbia, was was around then. Mm. Um, from a sustainability standpoint, they were also doing really interesting things. You know, the modern landscape of the outdoor industry and the brands that I, you know, associate with, or whether or not we're, you know, friends or competitors or frenemies, however you want to look at it, <laughs> are all really post 2010, post when we started. So there's been a wave of of sort of these these you know younger, fresher, millennial driven brands that came out of the recession mm. that you know we were one of the I would say first movers of. You know, in that group, I would say it's brands like Polar, mm. uh, Topo Designs, United by Blue, um, Hippie Tree. Like there's the recessionary, you know, pre slash post recessionary time period brands that came out of that that are really all focused on that sort of millennial driven outdoor consumer and oftentimes have a sustainability attribute to them as well. Mm-hmm. And then there's been a wave of, of brands since that since then as well. That's helpful. So. Going back to that first, you said you started with t-shirts. How did you think around the first product that you launched and almost way more importantly, how did you find the initial customers for this? So unlike many people in my generation, I, I started I started wholesale because that's what I knew. It wasn't hmm. a digitally native brand. I wasn't just trying to sell just through web. So I started with four t-shirts, super rudimentary basic designs that um, I slapped together and with the mission all along of removing a pound of trash for every product sold, and that was really the value add there. Organic cotton at a time when organic cotton was still relatively new and, and um, not nearly where it is now. Mm. So organic cotton teas, mission-driven, and environmental message. So I did the same thing that I did with Sanchak because that's what I knew. I mm. would walk into stores. I would take those teas in, pitch my brand, see if I could get some orders. That was the best the best way that I was doing things. I did also start to do some trade shows, which I had been doing a little bit with Sanchak, where you know, I, would, I would go to these um, these gift shows. That was more of the market for the jewelry brand, for, for United by Blue. I went in 2011 uh, to Outdoor Retailer for the first time. And since then, we've done that twice a year for the last nine years. So we've done probably 18, 19 of them. Um, that's become a cornerstone a customer acquisition channel for the wholesale market for us. That's where I started to pick up more, especially outdoor accounts and starting to grow the business that way. But yeah, I mean, like multi-channel approach, um, you know, going after stores in any way I could. A lot of cold calling. I used to spend days, hours each day calling stores directly and then following up with email and, and just hounding people. Mm. Um, cold calling was something that I really spent a lot of time, a lot of time early on with for the Mm. first several years. That was my go-to way of affordably acquiring new retail stores to to sell the product. And it would work. I would, you know, I'd find, I'd find retail stores based upon their, the store locators of of brands like Patagonia would, you know, you'd look at their store locator and be able to identify 
a store that's selling brand that we would sell well upon well, well alongside would be the market that I would want to go after. So I'd go after those stores that way. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and then by the time I was cold calling them and hounding them, you know, if, if then a trade show rolls around and the buyer walks by and I see their name badge, I was all over them. Hmm. So it was just a very aggressive, I, I, I'm a very, uh, aggressive, uh, in a good way, sales person that always was leading the charge when it came to the wholesale side of the business. Hmm. Do you think that that's still a viable approach for brands to take today? hundred percent. Yeah. It doesn't change that personal personal outreach, personal connections has not changed at all. There's definitely more technology enabled ways to do things, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, especially when it comes to the wholesale business, you really can't automate that. You can't, you can't overcome the fact that sales is a relationship and sales is a, an art. It really is. And, and building that relationship in a professional, but also incredibly human and fun and playful way is the only way to build a network of stores that are going to carry the brand. Hmm. And you have to then obviously be able to translate that beyond yourself as the founder. So, you know, now I have my, my in-house sales team that de dealing with those people and the relationships and we sell to, you know, 15, 13, 1500 different stores, but all of those stores still have a human relationship for the most part with somebody that is, is a part of United by Blue. And what do you think, it sounds like you've spent a lot of time thinking about sales and sales process. What do you think the thing is that early stage founders screw up most about early selling? I think it's the pay, it's patience. It's, it's, yeah. um, sales is a process. There's no, the idea of walking into a store and leaving with a check, you know, like that was like the most pure form of like used car salesmanship that, <laughs> that there is. And it was like, it, it, but it's not a reality of building a business. Um, good sales, a good sales process, especially in this industry can take can take time and, and it can take seasons of meeting people and seasons of revisiting the conversation and being present at trade shows, being present in their inbox, being present on the, on the phone to really have a meaningful business develop. There's certain retailers right now that, you know, we've been talking to for the last couple of years and they're very much in play, but they have not monetized. There's some that, you know, could be massive parts of our business in a year or two, but that's only because we're talking to them today. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it's very different than D2C. D2C also takes time and like, you know, selling products online is, 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 a, is a slog and it, it's not as simple and straightforward as, as, you know, the quote unquote overnight successes make it seem. But everything takes time, right? Everything from the developing of the product, like what right now we're working on. So it's February of 2020. We're working on fall of 2021 right now, developments. Wow. So that mindset early on, is something that is incredibly hard to get your head around. When I'm developing the first line in 2009 to launch in early 2010, you know, I'm still thinking in terms of months, not years. And to even get into the normal cadence of being able to take product to market that's then going to be shipped to market, you know, six months later is a very challenging thing to come to when you're only thinking about that immediate sale and that immediate impact to the business. But mm -hmm. but everything is in phases. Hmm. That's so interesting. And and when you look through, like I'm looking at my notes right now as we're talking and everything seems so purposeful. And I, I'm sure in hindsight, maybe it looks more purposeful than it was, but it certainly seems like you thought through so much of this, the insight that your customers weren't necessarily seeing the philanthropic part of your first company. So you made it more of, I don't want to cheapen it, but it, it, there's a very good soundbite there that like we remove a pound of trash. Like that is catchy. It's memorable. It makes it tangible. It's a very purposeful thing that can drive a company. And it sounds like it's been the thread since you were selling four t-shirts, you're still doing it. Yeah. So I, I think that that's just something that's so tough. And I, you mentioned this in a, I was watching a video when you were talking about honesty and I thought you brought up a really interesting point about how something really challenging for entrepreneurs is you need to have all of these different perspectives that are at different, sort of like different stages of your company. So you need to be honest to yourself in terms of like what the reality of your current situation is. But if you're talking to investors or to your team, you need to project something a little bit different. And I don't know, I think that having this purposeful long-term horizon approach can allow you as an entrepreneur to kind of live in the moment as well as in the future, if that makes sense. It does. It does. I mean, entrepreneurs are visionaries and, you know, you, you have to think the future is oftentimes even more important than, than the present. Hmm in terms of having a vision for where you're going as well as what you need to do to get there. 
And it's very challenging for me. I mean, like it's been a decade of building this brand, being at a point of being patient enough to be willing to to say, hey, you know, what I'm working on today is not going to generate immediate results. But in a year or two, this is going to be a meaningful part of our business or this could present a meaningful opportunity. Mm. Um, again, maybe it's just because of the tenure now of the brand is is a Obviously, it's just like as you get older, it's it's uh, the perspective of time is has changed. You know, a, a year is 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 super long when you know I have a three year old son, and a year is a lifetime to him. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just a blink of the eye to us. So same thing with business. That when the business is young, and and and, and again, the reality of that business when it's one is very different than when it's ten. And um, the challenges are somewhat similar, but the the perspective of of what success is, or how to measure success, or how to measure failure is very different as well. And so you just have to sort of always, always take those things in mind. Yeah. One last question on this, because I think it's, it's really interesting. There is a construct called the Eisenhower box. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was sort of a productivity tactic that Eisenhower used where there's basically four, a four box matrix and it's things are either urgent or not urgent and important or not important. And so obviously you sort of stay swamped with the stuff that's urgent and important, but it's really important to also focus on things or spend a good chunk of your time on things that aren't urgent but are important for the business longer term. And I think it's really tough as an early stage founder to focus on things that are important but not urgent. Do you have any suggestions or tactics or ways that you kept yourself focused on a certain amount of time spent on forward-looking stuff early on? Uh, You know, I think that was definitely a struggle. It it still is a struggle. I think it's always going to be a struggle. Um, But the industry that I'm in has almost forced me to adapt. And because I didn't work for a brand or or understand this this market before I started, I did go into it with not really understanding how these buying cycles work or how the development cycles work. So once I understood it, it almost became very clear to me that you have to have a very structured way of looking at what needs to be done to be able to even sell product into a market and and especially from a wholesale perspective again like you have to be taking product to market seven to eight months before it's even going to deliver to the stores and so when you start to back up again it took years and years of just continuing to push back and back and back and each each year each season it would be okay i'm gonna try to get it a month earlier a month earlier a month earlier a month earlier and 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 that compounds and it sort of created this 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 mindset and this culture for me personally to to recognize again to, to establish this sense of patience and this discipline that that then can apply to other parts of the business as well and can apply to building the team, investing into people, building a store, you know, opening a new office, all of these things. Again, it's not rocket science, but it, but this, this culture of looking at the longer term end goal or the bigger vision, it just requires a broader horizon. You need to look farther into the horizon to, to be able to actually build a business. And I think it's, I, I'm talking about it in the context of a retail business that has these long development timelines, long sales cycles, but I'm sure that applies to most any business. I mean, this this idea that, like you just said, that you, you have to focus on the things that are less urgent, but still really important to be successful in the long run. Yeah. And it, it becomes really difficult when you're a team of one or maybe two carving out that time, especially as you start to grow and inbound starts to be a thing and it gets tough. That's very helpful. I'll, I'll stop bugging you on that stuff. I just think it's so interesting to hear <laughs> how people approach that because I think that's like the core problem for so many entrepreneurs early is you've got maybe 12, 14 hours a day you're going to be able to work and prioritization is critical and you need to be filling that top of the funnel for success six months from now or a year from now. And it's hard to prioritize that when you've got people in your inbox asking for stuff. Yeah. And it's a slippery slope because if you're always just doing that, then then you're never going to have the big opportunities come to you. Yeah. You get inbound, you get people that are like, want to do business with you, but like the bigger opportunities are all going to be driven by you. And then like, so by me early on, I mean, those, those big opportunities and still like, I still try to involve myself in the, in the biggest opportunities that we have as an organization. I want to be pushing forward and I want to be driving mm. because at the, at the end of the day, I know without a doubt, what I want to do with United by Blue and this brand. And I know that I'm going to be here in, in a few years. And, and I know that I'm going to be able to take that project across the finish line. And, and, I, and I can't say that for, for other people as much as, you know, we have a great team. Like you're always more invested, right? As mm. the founder than anybody else. Mm. So you got to work on the stuff that differentiates the brand longer term. For sure. For sure. Cool. Um, there's a, I forget what founder was on. Somebody came and was talking about how the way that they solve this problem is through, they call it like the paperclip system 
where just on their desk they have two bins with paper clips in them and, and one would have say like 15 paper clips in it and the other one would be empty and each day they would do 15 things that were like pure outbound for future success so that might be cold calls or you know network emails or whatever it may be and then as you do them you move the paper clip over so that each day you end with the opposite paper clip bin empty to make sure you do 15 a day i thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> kind of a that's cool thing. yeah cool so so i want to talk real briefly so a lot of our founders who come through are interested in having a social component and i think that yourselves and then certainly like the tom's model is sort of blown up and it's everywhere and I think you take an interesting approach of not donating money, but owning the action yourself. And if you had a few minutes to talk or quickly talk about the difference between the two and the benefit that you're able to provide between the two, both literally the benefit and the benefit for the brand and the company, um, I think it'd be helpful for those people. Sure. So, you know, giving given away money or, or, or product is, in my opinion, it's you know, social enterprise 1.0 in, in the sense that and it's not to not to, to knock people that give away stuff or, or money, especially. I mean, you can do a lot of good with donation based model. But you know, when I was looking at what I was doing previously about giving money away, it's hard to have a, a measurable impact, and you're also just supporting, oftentimes, the overhead of another of another organization that you know that same overhead I you know I have in my own company. So it's, it's it seemed a little bit. Um, unimpactful. Hmm. And then also with, with donation-based models, you know, Tom's, which came out a couple years before us, um, again, am- amazing, uh, well-spirited, intentional company, but there's also a lot of obviously challenges with giving product away, whether or not from an environmental impact or economic impact, um, societal impact. So like it's, it's a lot less cut and dry than it seems from 30,000 feet when you really dive into these models. Whereas a activism driven mission like ours doesn't really have a lot of that baggage. Uh, And and what I mean by that is, you know, we exist to unite people around a cause. And that cause is to save our oceans and waterways from our own waste, our own pollution. And there's really nobody that can argue with the fact that Plastic does not belong in rivers and oceans. Mm. You know, there's never been uh, a conversation in all my years that I've had with anybody when I tell them about the issues that said, why don't we just leave the plastic there? You know, or I like plastic in the ocean. You know, there are people that like, you know, from a, you know, if you think about other environmental or societal causes, they're controversial, you know, whether or not that be whaling, for instance, or global warming, as much as, you know, that's obviously, in my opinion, not controversial. Mm. It is. Um, but plastic pollution in the oceans, even even climate change deniers are going to accept the fact that that is something that we should we should address and it shouldn't it shouldn't be that way. Mm. So our purpose and our existence is, is, is to mobilize these communities, both local and beyond, to care about something that is easy to care about. And, you know, when I started it, in 2010, I, I didn't really realize how much of an issue or how big of a, a topic it was going to become in, in 10 short years. But it's like it's blown up, right? Like you see, you see everybody talking about plastic pollution now, um, and and that's really inspiring to me because you know we're, we're just a small part of that movement that's happened. But I, I like to think that you know it's all ripple effects and it's all about change coming in waves. Is our tagline? It's it's about this this idea that you know obviously we we have to we have to start somewhere and we, you know, we can, by getting our customers involved, by getting our retailers involved, by getting our employees involved, we have an outsized impact than just say giving money away or giving product away. Yeah. And that makes a ton of sense about everything you've said. You've almost sort of, and I, again, I don't want to cheapen this, but you've almost productized the approach to get the most possible value out of something um, for the brand and for the amount of impact that you can create. You mentioned it when we started the show. Say it again. How, how many millions? Was it 2.5? Yeah, we're about at 2.5. It's um, incredible. It's really amazing. About 800,000 of that, 850,000 in the last year, and, and we'll do over a million this year. So wow. we're selling over a million products annually now, which um, means that those numbers are going to increase substantially. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I think that that's... So for in terms of takeaways for some of these earlier stage companies that are obviously going to have impact on a much smaller scale, but they're looking to start a company that has a philanthropic component to it for a cause that they really care about. It sounds like owning that cause and not outsourcing it 
and then figuring out potentially a soundbite or a way that, that you can align this with your brand so that there's no way for you to ever step away from that responsibility seems seems like a good start maybe. Anything else? I think uh, for me, it's it's also about having a cause that is, it's approachable. It's it's something that, mm. you know, obviously there's, there's so many important things to address in this world, but, you know, if you're really going to create a business model around cause that you also have, you know, true intentional purpose of doing good for, it has to approachable both for the employees as well as customers. And, and I think it's really important that United by Blue is a volunteer community-based mission that people can experience and people can be a part of, whether or not it's even them going out on their own and doing a cleanup, which we inspire people to do through our cleanup kits and, and a lot of our initiatives that we do. So it's approachable. It also ties back to the ethos and the beliefs of the customer that is ultimately going to buy the product, right? I think sometimes there's a disconnect between mission-driven brands and the product that's being sold. And for me, you know, we're selling largely to the outdoor community or people that love the outdoors. And if you love the outdoors, you care about this issue on a deep level. And seeing trash when you're on a hike or when you're at the beach or kayaking on a river really bothers you. It really, it really bothers our customer. And so it's it's an easy association to then be a supporter of United by Blue because of that. Awesome. And I think that that's um, kind of a good excuse to transition as you're talking about a million sales this year. I think it's a good part to talk quickly about the last couple of years that have been pretty explosive growth. So I think there are a lot of interesting things there. I think one of the things I'll start with is you guys have have raised capital. I'm curious to hear about the decision to do that and the thinking behind it and and how that's impacted the business. Sure. I mean, you know, raising capital is for us an important part of both capturing the business opportunity that is in front of us and the brand that we've created, as well as furthering our mission. And, you know, I think that as much as there's a lot of space in this market for, say, outdoor lifestyle, apparel and accessories, sustainability, there is a limited amount of market share for the products that we're making. Mm -hmm. And, And it's incredibly important for us to recognize when it's time to speed up and when it's time to slow down. And, and, and for us in raising capital, it's being cognizant of the fact that what we've created with United by Blue is, is, is a real and meaningful opportunity to be a leader in this movement for sustainable apparel and accessories. And I'm, a, as, you, as you know, from my talk about sales and, and this, this idea of growing this brand, I have a real desire to, to, to make United by Blue the generational brand in this space that people look back on and say, this was, this was an impactful, meaningful brand that existed or exists to do good in this world. And it was instrumental in us, in us advancing sustainability and advancing sustainable business models to the next level. And so the capital allows us to, to make that happen. It's an incredibly cash intensive business to run Mm -hmm. a business like this. We have a lot of SKUs. Um, We have a lot of investments into the development process. Uh, have about nearly 100 employees. So the capital is a very important part of that. We're, we're not going to sit back and say that you know we're, we, we've had the luxury of growth that just has filled the coffers with, with money. That's not the case. We, we put everything back into the company and whatever we've done on the capital fronts has allowed us to only, only accelerate that at a, at a higher degree. So I think that's a, also another point I wanted to touch on is a good transition to you do have a ton of SKUs, like a massive amount of SKUs. And you have, it seems like you test lots of things. Like I've noticed multiple campaigns coming out over multiple mediums. I remember you had a campaign over Kickstarter a little while ago. Um, How do you think about testing, validating, implementing new types of products? Yeah. I mean, we're we're fortunate to have the customer's permission to be a multi-category brand. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as much as started with graphic tees, there's not one thing that we do. And, and, and that's, a, that's, that's a pro and a con big time. You know, you see all the digitally native brands that are dedicated to like one category and, and, and when they do something different, it looks weird. Mm-hmm. So, but they also dominate in, in, in say one thing. So for us as a, as a lifestyle brand, the thing that we dominate or try to dominate on is sustainability and sustainable storytelling and and leadership in that in that regards and our, and our and obviously our mission and then we have the customer permission to to sell them a a, a t-shirt a a bag or a jacket or a sock mm-hmm. and people will will buy multiple categories from us because of that 
which presents arguably a bigger opportunity as a brand. Um, but it does also mean that we have to have a lot more SKUs, which obviously is a lot more capital intensive as well as um, risky when it comes to inventory management. The way that we try to get around that obviously is to make sure that the new things that we are doing are, are done in, in, in moderation and that we're, we are testing out new things before we dive uh, headfirst into it. So one of the categories that we've been building over the years is, is our bison shield insulation line. And that is we shear American bison, which is a salvage material that we identified we have a proprietary insulation that we have a patent pending for, and we make these jackets out of, and we also put the insulation in other products as well. And so that's something that started because we launched a sock that was using bison fiber, and we were able to, to launch you know, this sock, ultimate bison sock, which had a lot of traction, and that made us realize that there's demand for the story and the sustainability attributes of, of bison, <laughs> and, it's, and it's, it's just continued to grow from there. Same thing goes for anything, bags, our everyday reusables, which are all our kits and cases that are helping people live a more sustainable life. Everything has started from, you know, single SKUs. Um, the everyday reusables, for instance, started with a straw kit. Uh, now it has all these different kits are built around it. Our bags started, you know, eight years ago with a single canvas leather tote. Um, and now we've, we've built, you know, a really healthy bag business around it. So yes, it's, it is, it's constant development, constant iteration, making hard decisions about when to move past something like, like our kids line. Uh, hmm. we had a kid's line for a couple of years. We discontinued that last year. Um, it just didn't make sense for the business anymore, even though it was, you know, it was small. It was like five, six, seven, maybe $700,000 in business. So, so like, again, like when, when you're starting out, that seems like a meaningful amount, but it wasn't making money. It strategically wasn't aligned with where we were going with the brand and it was time to move on. Mm. So we did. It, it sounds like there's an overarching why and then the what has a consistent quality, but you're sort of agnostic to it. You're able to test a bunch of stuff out with different sustainable materials and different types of SKUs and things like that. See what works, double down or get rid of them all with a consistent North Star. Um, that aligns everything underneath so your customer doesn't get confused. It's not like, oh, well, you used to sell toothbrushes and now you're trying to sell me, you know, whatever, a water bottle. It's all consistent. Very cool. Um, I think the, the one thing, you know, also with United by Blue that we're, we're learning about our customer, especially recently, is that we are their resource for sustainability um, more so than anything. Even people are coming to us brand ag agnostic in some ways. Hmm. Um, we sell a handful of third party products mm -hmm. that aren't United by Blue products. And, and we sell them quite well. Like, you know, we sold hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes in the last few months, um, which is like, to me, it's like, it's indicative of the fact that the North Star, like you said, is this idea of sustainability and mission. And so the means to get there is to sell products that are, that are these sustainability driven products that allow us to accomplish our mission. And, and that sort of is an eye opening realization for us because it changes even the opportunities for United by Blue as a retailer, more of looking at us as both a retailer as well as a brand. And the retail platform that UnitedByBlue.com and our stores in Philadelphia can be, again, a multi-brand platform selling sustainability products or sustainability brands. And that's something that you'll see more from us as we grow is this idea that we are both retailer and brand mm. and they both work. Really interesting. Cool. So I, I've got two final questions. I want to be cognizant of, of your time. I'm looking through our... <laughs> The prep document, we got through about half of it, which is, that's about normal uh -huh. for, for this. Um, but I do want to ask two final questions. So the first one would be, what are the most important things that you did early on or that you would suggest other founders who have got an idea, maybe they've still got a full-time job, they're trying to flesh this thing out. What would you suggest that they do? Oh, I, you know, I mean, it's nothing out of the ordinary, but you really got to test it. You got to, you know, for me, it was, it was one box of jewelry from, from a market in Thailand that probably was like 500 bucks. Huh. And I, you know, I, I look back and yes, we've raised capital and we have, we have investors, but I look back and I say, you know, wow, like, you, you know, you can really do a lot with, with a little. Hmm. And I think it's, it's incredibly important to iterate. And even at that early stage to try things, iterate and figure out what works and what doesn't, because you learn so much by selling. And I think that if a founder is not selling, they're not learning. And so, so small steps, iteration, selling and learning, and then going back to the drawing board and, and scaling. What's the best, this is not one of the two questions. I, I snuck a cheat, uh -huh. a cheat one in there. Um, 
You've mentioned selling a bunch and you mentioned the books that you read. What's the best book on sales that you think founders should read? Well, that is a great question. Um, you know, my reading of sales literature after that first few years of, of <laughs> obsession has, has subsided. But I mean, I, I remember the, the book that I would literally carry around with me was literally, it was called Sales Bible. I, I don't know who wrote it. Um, I don't know if I would enjoy it now if I read it, <laughs> but but it was called the Sales Bible, and and I had that with me for years, and it's probably still sitting on a shelf somewhere. But it was the most introductory way of learning about sales for me in those early years, and I probably read it several times, and it did shape how I approached my business and sales. I think there was also a book called The Little Red Book of Selling, which was a much smaller version. That was one that I also carried around and I, I gave to all my early salespeople when I started hiring people other than myself, I would give them a little red book of selling. Again, I don't know how relevant it would be now, but they're definitely they definitely shaped my early beliefs. Cool. I'll link both of those in the show notes. Sweet. And the final one. So we've asked every guest, we've gotten all sorts of answers. If you were gonna start a taco truck today, what would the next six months look like? taco truck oh boy <laughs> i would probably be not trying to spend too much time in the truck itself as much as i would want to be selling i would be spending a lot of time meeting with a lot of the different businesses in philadelphia establishing employee incentive programs or figuring out ways to really connect with the leadership of these organizations and then parking our taco truck out for lunch at those offices and or trying to cater events for these offices. So I, I would really go similar wholesale approach where hmm. I'd be trying to go after the, the, the relationship of the decision makers that could then have an outsized impact on the success of that taco truck. Very cool. The hub and spoke model. We haven't heard that one yet. I like that. <laughs> Very cool. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. There is so much good stuff here. I'll end with one uh, sort of a plug for United by Blue. I guess it's a straight up plug for me. Um, I own a hat. I've got two sweatshirts and the backpack I'm using right now is from nice. me. Um, what's your favorite product? Well, my favorite product is the Bison Ultralight jacket. It's our newest innovation in Bison Shield insulation, which is, I mean, it's freaking amazing. It's, nice. it's, it's, less, than, it's less than a pound. It's rated to negative 10 Fahrenheit. Oh. It's the best piece of apparel that I own. Amazing. That might have to be my next one. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming by. My pleasure. Thanks, Brian. I hope this was as helpful as I hoped it would be. Head over to gettacklebox.com and click podcast to get some more detailed notes. And if you made it this far, please toss us a subscribe, a rating, and a review. Thanks. Have a great week.